Okay, welcome back to South Asia Part 2. We're going to talk about population geography as well as cultural geography. Um, as we talked about, this is the second most populous region in the entire world. And of the few countries, we actually, trying to hear how many countries, we said Maldives, Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, right? So that's seven countries. Three of these seven countries are actually ranked in the world's 10 most populated countries, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Remember, India is just right behind China with about 1.2, I think it's like 1.25. Um, China, we determined, was up to like 1.4 billion. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay. Um, population indicators. So we have... Um, Bangladesh, uh, popular. So this is 2010. Um, Bangladesh has about 150 million people. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of people. When you look about how small the country is, you can see that the population density is quite, um, quite severe, quite intense. Uh, Bhutan, small population, very small density. India, almost 1.25 billion people. Um, pretty low population density, relatively speaking, because there's a lot of land. Uh, but the people tend to live in very compact rural areas or urban areas. Or something like India has, I think, almost 50 cities with a million or more people. Um, but again, it's not a very urbanized region, as you'll see here. Percent urban is only 31%. On average, this region only has about 30% um, urban areas. And Maldives is quite small population, but quite small land area, so there's a high density. Uh, Nepal, small population, pretty low density. Pakistan, um, again, pretty high population, but they have a lot of land. Uh, and Sri Lanka, again, pretty similar. Rate of natural increase is not too bad. Total fertility rate is still pretty high. Um, it's getting better, and it has gotten better, and hopefully it will continue to get better. Uh, but, you know, for example, Pakistan is the highest with 3.6, which isn't surprising. Um, percent urban, as we just talked about, it's about 30% urban in general. Relatively speaking, they have a pretty large population that is under the age of 15. Um, that's actually a pretty big size of the population. Pakistan itself, 36. Nepal, I'm kind of surprised, not that much um, behind it at 36. Um, over the age of 65, very small percentage of the population is actually over the age of 65. Um, again, this is partially related to low life expectancies, um, health issues, uh, out migration as well. Mig migration, net migration for all of these from 2005 to 2010, except for Bhutan, all of it is negative. Maldives is right at zero somehow. I don't know why they put it as, as a negative zero. Um, but so there is definitely an out-migration for a lot of these countries. I'm actually surprised India is not quite as high. Um, it's only point, negative point 0.2. Um, so again, as we see in this region, we have very rapid population growth, but there's very differing approaches to family planning. So Pakistan, which basically has no family planning strategies whatsoever, has your very traditional uh, population pyramid, um, whereas some countries do take more proactive uh, family planning strategies, such as uh, Sri Lanka, for example, you can see um, has a slow population that's definitely slowing down. Uh, migration, as I said, one of this is one of the least urbanized regions in the world, with about 30% of the area urbanized. Um, however, today we are seeing rapid migration from villages, and again, these are compact rural villages, but we have people leaving the villages to large cities uh, for a couple different regions or reasons. But a big part of this is changing in agricultural systems has resulted in less agricultural jobs and people needing to move to the city for different opportunities. Um, that itself, and again, there are more employment opportunities in cities, but this again brings about a whole another set of problems, right? Um, so some of these main concerns are shanty towns or informal settlements, right, slums, um, and then soaring homeless populations within urban areas. Um, so a huge factor of this is actually, we briefly mentioned it in physical, in the first section of physical geography, uh, was the Green Revolution. Historically, this region is really unproductive, especially when you compare it to East Asia, which has been agriculturally productive. 
and very much successfully so. And this is actually a huge concern for this region, is that how will they continue to feed the population that they have? Um, so with the Green Revolution, we basically took a very unproductive region, uh, unproductive agriculturally speaking. Um, and with, so they did a couple of things. They got high yield varieties, so technology allowed us to select high yield varieties of predominantly wheat, but also um, as we see different uh, crop sins, we've got rice and we've got millet. Um, sorghum is also uh, grown a lot because it's a really cheap, easy grain and it doesn't um, require a lot of water input either. Um, but along with the high yield varieties, we needed to have a lot of, the, what, it's what resulted in chemical dependency. So what I talked about with pesticides and um, fertilizers. Well, with chemical dependency, and we've seen the same thing happen with a lot of the GMO crops in the United States, where people, once you switch to these types of crops, you have to keep using them. And if you don't, by being chemically dependent, you have to spend the money on fertilizers and pesticides. If you don't, you're not going to get the output. But a lot of farmers were very smart, small scale subsistence farmers. And in order to be competitive or try to make this work, they had to go into massive amounts of debt. Um, a lot of farmers, so let me back up, sorry, one second. While they would say this green revolution has been successful because it has increased the yields produced and it's helped feed the people, the problem is, is there are the social and ecological problems. So in the previous section, part one, I did talk about the ecological problems associated with applying you know, the chemical inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides, but there's been a lot of social problems associated with this. So we have gone from subsistence farmers um, farming people who made a living off of this and supported themselves as well as essentially had a bit of surplus to sell um, to more of a commercialized industrialized agriculture. Um, part of that and associated with this was massive amounts of people went into debt, major debt in order to be able to be competitive. And actually this resulted in one of the uh, worst you wouldn't really want to call it mass suicide, but it is one of the worst mass suicide events um, in, as far as we know, in, in human history. Um, and it was over, I think it was like over a 15, 20 year period. It was in the 90s to early 2000s where, where farmers were so in debt that um, thousands and thousands of them actually committed suicide. Um, so there's a lot of other social problems that were associated with this uh, green revolution. Um, so urban areas, as I said, we're seeing rapid growth. And again, this is related to um, decreasing opportunities in agriculture in rural areas. This is resulting in a lot of serious problems for cities. So it's interesting because in the previous unit, we talked about um, East Asia over-preparing, China in particular, over-preparing for urbanization um, and almost, I mean, literally just missing it, making this massive fail as well. Um, in this situation, we just have no preparation whatsoever. So we have serious problems in a lot of cities regarding homelessness, poverty, congestion, traffic congestion, water shortages. Uh, again, arage pollution, sewage disposal, the infrastructure does not exist for the amount of people coming in. Um, so we've seen this huge increase in squatter settlements, which are called buskies. Um, and different than what we've seen, if you think back to Latin America, and I showed you these pictures of basically these bamboo structures being built, these bamboo homes being built over the manglers. Uh, what we actually see here is people building, you think here in Waikiki, you can't even sit or stand on the sidewalk. What we have is people actually building a temporary structure on the sidewalk and that becoming more of a formalized um, structure, not, I mean, not formal structure, but becoming settlements along uh, roads and alleyways where people are just filling in the, the sidewalks and the streets. Um, and this has led to a lot of political and ethnic tensions. Um, and as I'll show you here in a couple of slides, a lot of times we think, oh, well, India, they are all the same, but there actually are a lot of um, ethnic differences um, and associated with that is also religious differences. And that has created a lot of tensions in a lot of the cities. Uh, so here's a couple examples. You can see these um, hutments, this busky system that I talked about basically just right there, people building out from the sidewalk. Um, and then on a completely opposite, you have um, Karachi, uh, in which was a previous British colony, and you can actually see the strong influence 
um, the colonial influences here and uh, it looks like a large um, bus station and um, like a central plaza area and market. Um, so again, very huge difference as we see again with some of those things. Uh, so cultural geography. Historically, this region has been predominantly Hindu. It historically, I should say, was Hindu. Um, Islam, I find this interesting. Uh, your book refers to it as an added new element, but they, it actually was a new element from about a thousand years ago. It's not too new. Um, we have British imperialism as a huge factor. Um, religiously, um, culturally, uh, you'll find this uh, a lot actually has strongly influenced the caste system was the British imperialism. Um, it has influenced uh, linguistics, it has influenced politics, it has uh, the British uh, in the British and Imperials of the rule included Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. Um, so we do see this huge Hindu nationalist movement, uh, especially in light of the strong influences and a lot of the ethnic tensions that exist in some places within India, um, and then especially within Pakistan and then a few other regions, but predominantly Pakistan. Uh, we're seeing Islamic fundamentalist movements happening as well. Um, and those move those the Islamic um, fundamentalists would be much of what we talked about um, for uh, Northern Africa and Southwest Asia, so AKA the Middle East. Um, so the Hindu civilization has existed for a very long time in this region, well over a thousand years. With that comes the caste system, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, we also have a lot of uh, Buddhist sectors, especially in Sri Lanka. You'll actually find, uh, occasionally I'll come across an article where uh, English woman, for example, was traveling in Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka is uh, very Buddhist, um, very strict laws, and, you know, it's very common for people to have tattoos of Buddha or um, certain religious symbols on their body. Um, and there have been, it was not that long ago, I read this article about this British woman and she was arrested and detained and almost not allowed to leave because it was um, sacrilegious and offensive. Uh, and she was a practicing uh, Buddhist, um, but again, coming from a different culture and different way of viewing um, the religion, right? Uh, so the arrival in actually Sri Lanka is really still very conservative, especially for women to, I don't remember what it was. I think it was recently a year or two ago, there was the potential to put on the ballot in Sri Lanka, or the Senate had the option of allowing women, I don't know if it was allowing women to drink alcohol or allowing women to drink alcohol in public. I can't remember what it was. Um, and it was considered immoral and they turned it down. They wouldn't even vote on it. Um, so it's a much more conservative country. And then we have the arrival of, Is of Islam with the Mughal um, Empire. Again, this is about a thousand years ago. Um, predominantly in the north and specifically in the northwest and the northeast corners, which again makes the connection between Bangladesh and Pakistan as well. Uh, so we have the caste system, which is part of Hinduism. Um, the caste system, I'm not going to go into it too much. Um, there's some really good videos out there. Your book goes into it. But it's basically a, con a complex Hindu social order. You've probably heard about it. It is illegal. Um, today it's illegal. They say it was. It always existed. So I think there's like five or six levels. Your book talks about them. Um, and you're born into this. So part of Hinduism is like this system of um, reincarnation. But you reincarnate into the same level. So let's say your parents were janitors, uh, like the lower caste system. You will never be able to go to university, at least when this caste system is more active. You won't be able to go to university and be a doctor. Um, and it has nothing to do with economics. It's just, I mean, it does, but um, the economic factor is associated to the caste factor. Um, the lowest order is actually Dalits or um, untouchables. You're not supposed to, it was believed that if you even touch them, you know, they're just, they're dirty people. Um, so it's based on a hierarchy system. 
and again, you were born and you remain in the caste system. You're not supposed to marry out of your caste either. And there is, there has been a lot more reform and attention brought to this. But again, things don't, you know, we technically eradicated slavery in the United States or abolished slavery over 150 years ago. Um, however, it took more than 100 years for uh, black children and white children to be able to go to the same school. And even then, we still have institutionalized racism within our country. So just because you get rid of a formal structure doesn't mean that it disappears. Um, in this structure, while well, they say it is being undermined by a modern economy and social reform, um, it's still a very slow, slow change. Um, so I just wanted to throw this up there because, again, I wanted you to see a little bit that it's not, while the predominantly this region is Hindu, uh, Sri Lanka is a really good example there where you can see there's Hindu, Islam, uh, Buddhism, uh, Sikhism, Christianity. Uh, so it's a very um, mixed island. And you can see a lot of this uh, region. Pakistan is obviously predominantly Muslim, Bangladesh as well. Bhutan, Nepal is predominantly Buddhist. Um, but India, you can see, and there's some areas that are mixed. Um, so we've got, there's a Buddhist and Hindu, um, we have Islam and Hindu, a couple different areas where there's a lot of mix. And the, you can find, um, there's a lot of different tensions related to this as well in the media. Um, and actually, let's say uh, Sikhism, which is predominantly located in the north, is actually, so when you hear on occasion, um, you know, after 9-11, whenever there's these usually a series of hate crimes, boom and hate crimes. There were several Sikhs who were actually attacked. Um, and I'll play the computer and let's see what's going on. There we go. Um, so there were several Sikhs. Sikhs are the ones who wear turbans. Um, the males wear turbans. Uh, one of the most easily uh, physical characteristics um, to recognize. And a lot of Sikhs were attacked and or killed um, because, again, they were just automatically assumed to be Muslim. I mean, they, they're not. It's a completely separate religion. Um, not going to go too much into language. Um, there's, again, this is predominantly a Dravidian linguistic group in this area. So there are a lot of similarities. Um, it's a very multilingual region. Not quite the same as Africa, but generally speaking, it's a very multilingual region. Um, we see more Indo-European languages in the north. There's a lot of, for some of the countries, um, linguistic nationalism, and this is tied as well. The language is tied, connected to the religious groups and the ethnic groups. Um, and there is a strong role of English in the country because, again, uh, India, or sorry, in the region, India uh, predominantly has maintained a lot of English-speaking, but these were former British colonies. Um, so... I was saying, your book doesn't define diaspora in this unit, but it does uh, frequently, and it kind of alters the definition. But I think diaspora is basically a spread out um, group of the population. So Hawaiian diaspora would be uh, Hawaiians who live in different regions. Um, there is usually some type of connection still. India, um, they've also got the whole region here, but uh, particularly Indians, again, because of the larger population, um, has a huge diaspora. There was a lot of out-migration to um, British colonies um, more recently. I mean, so much so, I should actually say Fiji and um, Mauritius, which are the two circles. Uh, we got Mauritius down here and uh, Reunion, which is next to it. And um, Fiji, where actually the majority of the population now is ethnically related to um, descendants of Indians. Um, so there's a strong Indian influence um, and population throughout many places in the world, North America in particular, by the UK. Um, and then there's also a large flow, especially as we talk, if you think back when we talk about Middle East and um, temporary workers, um, of more temporary workers, and this is a more mainstream contemporary immigration as well. Um, okay, uh, we're just going to wrap this up. So this region does have a widespread use of English throughout. Um, you, there's a lot of outsourcing regarding uh, service, customer service and caller service stations as well. Uh, we've seen a global spread of South Asian culture to other countries. 
um, especially cuisine as well, for example. Um, migration from South Asia to the developed world, which we talked about, and a lot of brain drain. A lot of professionals have come to the United States. A lot of people leave to study um, and don't go back home. And there's also a lot of cultural tensions within the country as well, especially as uh, immigration or um, tourism has increased. Uh, so this is a scene from Goa Beach, which is was previously... I'm pretty sure Goa was actually a Portuguese colony. Um, and it's a very popular beach setting. But you can see the locals on the beach. Uh, looks like a Muslim family. Uh, the woman is, the mother I'm assuming, is completely covered. The headscarf, um, her face is not covered. But so she doesn't have a veil on, but she does um, pretty much completely cover her body. Um, even the men are wearing long pants and long sleeve shirts. Yet we have a, let's just assume maybe a British or a French couple uh, lying on the beach soaking up some sun. And the man is, looks like barely more than a pair of speedos. It is a little bit more, but definitely some uh, rather cheeky shorts there. So um, this has led to a lot of cultural tensions as well. Um, and not just with foreigners and locals, but as I mentioned, a lot of cultural and ethnic tensions within the country. Because it is quite an ethnically mixed area or region. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and we'll continue with part three. Have a good day.